join us in a festival that promises to be extraordinary because Bali is extraordinary. Feelings are okay. We don't want them. We don't want to feel sulky and shitty and um, what was that? What would that be that I felt then? Unappreciated. Yes. Yes. Or, you know, like a bewildered or anxious or terrified. We've all got these ones as well as the more delicious feelings. But but to be um, to be happier in ourselves and go, well, they're okay. She's allowed to be sulky and weird. We will get sulky and weird. I still love her. She's sulky and weird. Do you still love you when you're sulky and weird? Because most of us do not. Most of us know I can be very kind to my little grandchild. I can go, oh, little Jubby, you're a sweet little thing, even though you're being a total not very nice thing at the moment. <laughs> but we don't do it to ourselves. We mainly give ourselves a really hard time. You got that wrong, you didn't look terrible, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so don't do that. That's my message to you. <laughs> I'm going to read you another little piece, and then, if you're lucky, So this is just a little prayer. On New Year's Eve, a prayer. May I make way for the new, greeting each moment as a fresh beginning. May I be truly content with the abundance of life. May I let all things be as they are. Say yes, please, to everything and all of it. Write heart's ease in cloud letters in the wide blue sky. May I trust in the wide magic of everyday existence. Imagine positive outcomes instead of bothering everything to death. May I encourage myself at all times. May I remember to live creatively, luxuriating in the simple, the quiet, and the miraculously ordinary. May I connect. May I help others when I have authentic energy for it and rest when I don't. May I remember that I am a part of something much larger than myself and act accordingly. May the politicians forego their own greed for power and money for the sake of all beings, for the sake of the broken world. Can there please be a section in the paper, newspaper called poetry instead of one called property? I would also like some green velvet slippers with roses on. Namaste. Thank you. Amen. And... After I read that in the Spearwood Library, a dear woman called Diane Niati made me. And Michael said I had to do this, so this is just to remind you that there should always be room for whimsy. Whimsy and fun. Politicians forego their own greed for power and money, for the sake of all beings, for the sake of the broken world. Can there please be a section in the newspaper called poetry instead of one called property? I would also like some green velvet slippers with roses on. Namaste. Thank you. Amen. Mm-hmm. 
guy so much and it's also really amazing that his partner is also called Bridget so we have a lot of fun with that <laughs> the Bridgets the Bridgets all right so I'll read another little piece out of here more and more I trust that creativity and rest are my best medicines that play is the highest form of research as Einstein said creativity requires me to be open to my inner life to allow ambiguity to trust myself and my process Creativity invites me to dress colourfully, to sew and draw and cook, to visit the beach and the park, to practice doing lovely things which are necessary for my healthy survival. It lies beyond seeking security, approval, comfort and control. Under the surface of duty and habit are fresh ways of being and doing. It's big wisdom to examine something carefully and realise that if it brings you trouble, stop doing it. This includes... Negative self-talk, mean-spirited behaviour, grabbing more than you need, hanging out with people who bring you down, any behaviour that exploits or demeans you, anything that wears you out or drains you. Starting from a place of self-acceptance, moving outwards into a world that badly needs love and good energy, extending the hand of truth, integrity and kindness to others is a deep form of self-compassion. Although we do not always see our place in the great mystery, we are not separate. We are our mother's recipes, our neighbours' sorrows, our friends' memories, our dog's friskiness. We are the last cigarette we ever smoked, first heart we ever broke, the fireworks, the folly, the shoe abandoned at the beach. All of this connected in ways we will never fully understand, but here we are in this beautiful broken world with our tender, aching hearts, a part of something vast and magnificent. To trust life as it is and savour one's part in it, what could be lovelier or kinder than that? It has been quite a year. The things I have lived, I share with you. Let us give the Buddha the last word, which always seems a wise thing to do. You can search the tenfold universe and not find a single person more worthy of loving kindness than yourself. Hmm. And we really forget that. I can tell you that a thousand times, but can I live it? No, because it's not like an idea that then, okay, I've got the idea, got that sorted. No, it's a journey. It's a dance. It's a lifetime practice, and there's no right answer to it. So one day the right answer might be, lighten up, girl, eat some chocolate. The next day the answer might be, stop stuffing your face with endless amounts of chocolate and go for a walk. <laughs> And the same with television. It's sometimes it's absolutely appropriate to lie there and watch a beautiful show about Greece and drink cups of tea. Other days, if you realise, I'm not that I've ever done this, but I've been watching TV for three days and I probably need to have a shower. <laughs> you probably do. <laughs> yeah. And because what I have really come to realise that is that you'll never get all your ducks in a row. You'll try really hard. You'll go, if I just get this sort and I just get that sort and I just leave this relationship and I just get my tax done like this, no, it'll keep on rolling. We're very vulnerable. We don't know what'll happen next. Some of it'll be brilliant. Some of it'll be dreadful. And on we must go. Step by step, we must go, as Menindra G said. So we do the best we can appropriate to circumstance. And sometimes we'll get it incredibly wrong. So I've always liked this little anecdote. It's Anne Lamotte's son, who was... Um, about seven at the time, he said, I think I understand life, mum. I'm mainly good, some bad bits. And then, or, or the artist David Shrigley, who, who made a little artwork that said, um, good and brown all wrapped up in the same brown paper bag. So there, and we make our own um, game plan. We go, what's appropriate for me? Okay, your friend goes to Pilates, doesn't mean you have to go to Pilates. Your other friend goes jogging, does it? You have to find out what, what your things are and honour them. And, um, yeah, sometimes they're really weird. I'll tell you my weirdest. I, in writing classes, I get people to go, what are some of your strange habits? And um, one of mine is if I see food on the street, I, I would really quite like to walk on it, especially if it's a twisty. 
twisties I'm fond of anything crunchy on the street. I will step on. So, and uh, just a writerly story, because they say, I'm talking about honouring your behaviours and habits, would, would be that um, writers, a lot of writers have really strange habits. So Edith Sitwell used to apparently lay down on a coffin and wrote, um, you know, Schiller sniffed rotten apples. He had rotten apples in a drawer and he'd smell them and apparently had the phenomes that help him write. Lawrence, who wrote um, Women in Love? Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence, would climb naked in a mulberry tree because he believed that sensual feeling would get him creatively. And so I read a wonderful essay once with Di by Diana Ackerman and she was asking people about their strange habits as writers. And she asked her friend called William Gass, he was a, um, he's a novelist in New York. She said, so what are your strange habits? He said, oh, I have none. She said, no, well, what do you do every morning? He said, well, it was in New York, I think I may have mentioned. I get up every morning, I take my camera and I just prowl around <laughs> and I take photos of really like derelict things, you know, the under towers and abandoned railway lines and strange dark corners at the end of the Brooklyn line. And, and then I go home and write. And she said, well, you know, you think that's strange? He goes, oh, no, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> for time. A lady was going to come and say five minutes, and I'm feeling that it maybe is almost five minutes. I'm on my watch here. Do she we care? Do we care? <laughs> what else can I tell you? Um, I'm just looking on, I've got a list here. What to tell you? <laughs> See if there's any good on the list. Ah, oh, yes, this is important. I think a lot of it, and I write this in the book, thinking. I think we do too much thinking. One of my Buddhist teachers said 90% of what we think is quite useless. You've got to have 10% thinking, which will help you pay your tax and get there on time and remember to buy your friend's birthday card and all of those things, and maybe have a wise idea about your next creative project. But huge amounts of our thinking are not in the least bit interesting. They're loops, but there's rumination, and who has not done this and just go over and over the same until over and over again for no particular reason. That's not helpful. And a lot of our thinking, which is judgment. So I'll just tell you an example of this in my case where over the thinking, not useful. Last week I was at the Geraldton Writers Festival. So forgive me if I'm a bit tired because I am a bit tired. But that was cool. And we went up on the plane and we had the Geraldton Writers Festival. But before all this, I was going to be on a panel and there was a lovely woman journalist, she was Chinese, and she was meant to get in touch with me weeks before to tell me that she was moderating the panel and just to talk to me and get to know me a bit. And so, she, but I said to her at that point in time, weeks before, that I'm about to go on a self-retreat so I can either talk to you now or in about a week. And she said, oh, let's talk in about a week, but I'll probably have forgotten by then. I thought, well, that's odd. You're only 30. Why would you be forgetting? Anyway, that was fine. Then she sent me an email a bit later saying, um, would either of these, could you speak to me on Monday or Wednesday? Yes, I could speak to you on, it was actually Thursday at four. I wrote back, yes, can't do Monday, Thursday at four, that'd be good. Never heard back from her. And then it was Thursday, it was nearly four. And this is what was happening in my thinking. I want to dob you in, they're paying you and you haven't got back to me. And why, why did you say, you, well, I'm feeling a bit anxious because you said four and I'm meant to be around at four and I've you know, created my day around, you were going to ring me at four. And, and I was quite annoyed with you and it just went over and over like, my friend Jewel was probably laughing because I get very anxious when people don't get back to me. I turn it into they hate me. If it's my daughter or not, it's because she hates me. So it's never because she's busy or anything. So with this woman, I was very cross with her. And she, then I got a, suddenly got an email saying, sorry, I haven't got back to you. Would four work? It's like, yep, four will work. Then she rings me. My father just died. No wonder she'd been preoccupied. She was trying to arrange a funeral in Melbourne. And of course, poor woman. And so that's just an example of how you think it can be completely faulty and completely of very little use to you. And so part of the sort of what is helpful to one when one is not coping or just what is helpful to one anyway is to get out of the thinking and come into the body. And there it's a, like, what's happening in my body? Oh, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I seem to be rather anxious. What would be useful? Would it be useful to lie down with the wheat pack and say lovey-dovey things to myself? Would it be useful to go for a walk? Would it be useful to actually ring the person I'm feeling anxious about and talk to them like something? 
what's the most appropriate thing to do? Or could I just sit quietly and go, this is what's happening in my body right now, very tenderly, this is what's happening in my body right now. Like everything else, it would pass. But could I be loving kindness to that? And I just remember an example of being actually down on the street years ago, on the street corner with my husband, Paul, at the time, and my friend, Kathy. And we were trying to work out which movie to go to. And we're going, oh, no. And we seem to be getting ratty, not with one another, but it was all sort of probably a 40-degree Perth day and maybe the movie wasn't at the right time. We're getting ratty. And then Kathy said very wisely, I think we're really tired. Why don't we just go home and have a rest? <laughs> Tick. So, yeah, that, that's a good way to listen to the body. Because And um, I don't, I'm just going to throw this in for free, seeing I got it from therapy yesterday, but talking to my therapist. And another thing which I talk about in there is decision-making. Some of us, especially people who are a bit mentally ill and had a terrible childhood, are not good at decisions. And we get like, should I do this and should I do that? And one Zen teacher of mine said, um, we don't like the don't know place. We're not very good with don't know. So we'll rush decisions to yes or no. And often it would be the wrong decision. So the woman that I see now and again, just for fun, said to me with that, if you don't know what to do, I mean, you're going to go, no, we need that. But um, leave it alone till you do know what to do. Just go, I don't know what to do about this. And then you go, okay, full information has not yet come to me. If, I mean, if, you, if it's like, shall I jump off this bridge because the house is burning? Probably do it. Don't wait for more information. But otherwise, I would be thinking that it, was, um, it would be a good idea to wait. So that's pretty much all I've got for you. Thank you for listening. But my beautiful friend Michael may have something else. Uh, Bridget and I went down to Margaret River and did something like this down there. Uh, but this and, is better. Yeah, this is way better. That was just that was rubbish. Terrible down there, but this is really going well. Uh, we thought we would, as we did there. Oh, hello. Have we, have we got a guitar in the house? Can you hear that? Good, good, good. Um, we decided we'd finish with, uh, really it's a blessing. It's from the Hindu tradition, which in a way, given that we're bubbling, is appropriate, though this particular chant has an Indian pedigree rather than an Indonesian one. Um, and we just like the sentiment of this. We like the music of it, but we like the sentiment. It's a prayer which or a blessing, it's like a doxology, I guess you call it in Christian terms. It's a, an end of service blessing, which typically uh, is the last thing you hear people say or sing in, in these ceremonies. And it, it, the words are loka samasta sukino bhavantu. And it simply means may all beings in all worlds experience peace and happiness. And it's a very sweet sentiment. Uh, and it's in that spirit that we like to say goodbye and say thank you. Uh, the very last words in this uh, chant are Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And it just means, well, it doesn't just mean, it absolutely means peace, peace, peace. It's worth saying three times. It's worth saying a lot of things three times. So to all of you and to you, Bridge. And to me, peace, 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 and thank you. Loka Samasta Sukino Bavantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bavantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bavantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bavantu Shanti, Shanti, Om 
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Shanti, Shanti. Om Shanti, Shanti. Shanti. I told all my friends to come because we were a class act, so. <laughs> <laughs>